Good day, folks, and happy Sunday uh, to each and every one of you. And it's good to be here, as I have say week after week, to be here with you. And thank you for inviting me into your, into your places. Um, we are continuing in our sermon series, uh, The Path to Life, uh, as we work through uh, Psalm 119, verse by verse, or stanza by stanza, if you will. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Psalm 119, and we'll be working, we'll reading, we'll be working through one, verse 121 to 128. And it was during this last week, folks, that uh, I often read a number of things, and I came across an article that captured my attention, because the title of the article is, Whatever Happened to Pursuing Godliness? It's an article by uh, Matthew Payne. Now, it was posted about six years ago, but after reading through uh, Payne's article a few times, it struck me how relevant Payne's thesis is for today. He, be he begins by stating this, quote, In my experience, most Christians aren't very interested in godliness. Then he goes on to add this other comment, quote, My experience is that calls to godliness among modern Christians are largely met with silence. It doesn't excite or interest us much. The Bible tells us endlessly to be holy, to be godly, to pursue righteousness, but, that's, but that doesn't get our hearts racing. We tend to get excited about outward actions, not personal renewal or repentance. End quote. You know, it's interesting to note that Payne at the time of this article was pursuing a PhD uh, at Sydney University uh, in Australia, and among his research, he was reading around uh, a lot of the writings of the 16th and 17th century Christians, the Reformers, the Pur Puritans. And he discovered, uh, and was struck, according to his article, by their passion with godliness. Payne discovered that the biblical call to holy living was reflected in the priorities of the Christians of the 16th and 17th century, especially the Reform authors. This was in contrast, he said, to the modern Christians today who, according to, to Payne, are obsessed with pragmatics. What will produce the best results, we ask? And he goes on to say, perhaps godliness just seems impractical to us. Perhaps we fear that it is threatened to make us too heavenly minded to be of earthly good, as the saying goes, end quote. Now, since then, Payne has completed his PhD and... And he does make good use, uh, good, solid biblical study and research in his article. And his points are indeed grounded in the Word of God. Because, friends, the pursuit of godliness is something that the Word of God claims to be, as Payne said, of immense practical value here and now. And as we begin to unpack the text for today, we will discover that godliness is not only practical, as Payne would suggest in his article, but it is the will of God for all believers. Now, the Apostle Paul helps us to understand this in his letter to his first letter to Timothy, his, his uh, uh, fellow co-worker and dear friend. Paul said to Timothy, rather train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 to 9. You know, and I think I'd go a f I would go a step further and say the godliness of an individual believer is directly related to the extent the church reflects the holiness of God in practice and certainly in contrast to the culture that we live in today. Apostle Peter reminded the church that he was writing to uh, in his first letter, Peter said, as he called you, is holy, you also be holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. So here we are in Psalm 119, beginning in verse 121. I have done what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Give your servant a pledge of good. Let not the insolent oppress me. My eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. Deal with your servant according to your steadfast love and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for the Lord to act, for your law has been broken. 
Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. Therefore, I consider all your precepts to be right. I hate every false way. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Please join me in prayer. Lord, I thank you uh, for your word. And as we now spend some time working through these verses, we ask God by your spirit to help us understand, uh, understand the text, uh, the application of that in our own lives, and ultimately that it would bring you great, great glory and honor as we uh, follow and obey your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, without any hesitation, let's just dive right into the deep end of the pool. It certainly is clear from our reading of the text that one of the greatest desires for the psalmist was that his life would reflect the character and nature of God. We should remember throughout this whole uh, sermon series that the psalmist had this deep abiding relationship with God and that his experiences in his relationship with God, the good, the bad, and the ugly, would not change his resolve to live his life for God. You know, as God's image bearer, as Genesis 1 describes. And we see this lived out here in the psalmist's life, right in verse 121, when he said, I have done what is just and right. I have done what is just and right. We go to uh, another, we go to another in the Old Testament, the Micah, the prophet, one of the minor prophets, who asks a really great question. Micah said, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? That's from Micah chapter 6, verse 6. So in other words, what Micah was saying is, what can I bring with me before I stand, with me when I stand before God? What can I do when I stand before God? And then he gives some suggestions in the text. Do I bring a thousand, ram, thousand of rams, Micah? Asked, chapter, uh, verse 7 of chapter 6. Do you want me to sacrifice my firstborn for my transgressions, for the sin of my soul? Micah asks, and it's the same verse in chapter 6, verse 7. With what shall I come before the Lord, before God? And then he gives a, what is a concise uh, uh, verse on the requirements of God for his people. Micah said, he has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to, do, and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Verse 8, chapter 6 of Micah. So the psalmist, as I already said, right here in verse 121, said, I have done what is just and right. Now, as we look at this uh, stanza from a bird's eye view, uh, we find, that, as we've done in the past, when we look at it from, that, from, the, from the whole picture, we find a contrast, a contrast between the psalmist and the psalmist as he describes them in verse 121, his oppressors. And we see that these are the people the psalmist described as insolent. So these are insolent oppressors. And that Hebrew can also be translated uh, as arrogant or proud or presumptuous, all kind of points in the same direction. And these are the people that the psalmist describes here in this stanza as lawbreakers in verse 126. For your law has been broken. Speaking to God, but that these oppressors had broken the law of God. Well, we need to understand that this is more than just disobeying a rule or two. This is not like a speeding ticket or this is not just disobeying a rule or two. In order to get the idea here uh, of the ramification and seriousness of this breaking of the law, we can go to chapter 11 of Jeremiah, and you want to turn in your Bible so that that'd be fine. Keep your finger back in Psalm 119. And there we find the prophet Jeremiah uh, in chapter 11. God, I mean, God speaking through the prophet of Jeremiah concerning his covenant with the nation of Judah. It was a covenant that God had made with their forefathers, their forefathers when he brought them out of Egypt. And you can find that information in the book of Exodus. And here in chapter 11 of Jeremiah, many years have gone by, God through his prophets said to the nation of Judah, listen to my voice and do all that I command. 
So shall you be my people, and I will be your God, that I may confirm the oath I swore to your fathers. That's in Jeremiah chapter 11. I'm not, you can just take a look at that whole chapter yourself. There you go, pointing back to the covenant that God had made with their forefathers at Mount Sinai. And then this was followed up by uh, another, another word or an example of what the nation of Judah was doing. Judah was instructed to repent, and then this is the summation of the findings, again in Jeremiah 11. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone walked in stubbornness of his evil heart. And again, God, speaking through the, uh, the prophet Jeremiah, said this about Judah. They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words. They have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant I have made with their fathers. So there's a point to be made here that's important. One commentator put it this way uh, in regards to verse uh, 126, for your law has been broken. Quote, the word broken together with the word law or Torah may well be understood in the prophetic sense as they have broken covenant. End of quote. Oh, so this is not just breaking a rule or two. This was by Judah as a nation breaking of the covenant between God and Judah, between God and his people. So that's when he's facing his oppressors, these insolent oppressors, these lawbreakers, these covenant breakers, the psalmist prayed to God and asked God to give your servant a pledge of good. Let not the insolent oppress me, verse 122. And it'd be something appropriate to pray for because they had broken the covenant with God. I also want us to notice here a number of phrases beginning in the very first verse at 121, working our way through to the very last, 128. We have phrases like, I have, my eyes, I am, I love, I consider, and I hate. You know, we understand these uh, in a grammatical sense as personal pronouns, but we find that the psalmist was offering up to God, really, his love and loyalty. His love and loyalty. His love and loyalty to the commandments we see here in verse 127. I love your commandments. We go to another person in the Old Testament, this time King David. In his praises, he says to God, the glory of God. He praises to the glory of God in Psalm 19. That's where I'm at right now. And then he goes on in verse 7, 8, and 9 to say this. The law of the Lord is perfect. The precepts, precepts of the Lord are right. The commandments of the Lord is pure. So the word of God, according to King David, is perfect, right, and pure. And then we see what the fruit or the benefit that comes in David's life from this perfect, right, and pure word of God. It revived David's soul. We see this in Psalm, in verse 7 of Psalm 19. It, it um, produced rejoicing in David's heart. The next verse, it brought illumination or understanding to David's eyes, to his mind and to his heart regarding God and his word. So these graces that David received from God through his word can be applied to our psalmist here in Psalm 119, who prayed in verse 123, my eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. Like David, the word of God well, revived his soul, made his heart rejoice, and he got understanding of his situation. You see, we find in the life of the psalmist what Payne said about the pursuit of godliness, quote, it is the most practical thing you can pursue. Godliness, my friends, is the most practical thing you can pursue. So I have a question for you. One to ponder and consider and give us some thought. Are you pursuing godliness in your life? You know holiness and righteousness as commanded by the word of God? You know, I, I, I no doubt some of you are struggling with, with this, whole, this whole thing of godliness in your life. I understand that. 
But I want to ask you, if someone were to ask you to define by biblical godliness, what would, what would you say? Would you say that a godly person is someone uh, who goes to church every uh, week and attends a bi- weekly Bible study, prays and reads their Bibles daily, uh, goes on mission tri- trips, and someone who is involved in evangelism or all of the above? Is that your definition of godliness? Certainly all those things are good and, and appropriate, and I would encourage you to do all or any of those. Absolutely. Absolutely. But is what we do uh, as a reflection of our godliness? Or do we assume that a person who does a list like that is a godly person? But have we ever asked another question concerning godliness? Is the fruit of the Holy Spirit evident in our lives or the lives of those we hold up to as godly? And do you know the fruit of the Holy Spirit the Apostle Paul reminds us of this in Galatians 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, and 22 and 23, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So again, is godliness revealed in our lives or the lives of others by how many ministries one is involved in? Well, that could, we, we can be involved in ministries and be godly, but is that the definition of a godly person? Or as Payne said in his article, quote, godliness is primarily about character. It's about your character, about my character. It's from the inside out, so to speak. The wise Solomon said this, the righteous lead blameless lives, Proverbs 20, verse 7. The righteous lead blameless lives. Did you notice the word that's not there? perfect lives. It's not about perfection, but do the righteous lead blameless lives. Remember we began our time with the Apostle Paul who had exhorted Timothy to train yourself for godliness in 1 Timothy 4, uh, 7 to 9. Well, he writes another letter to Timothy and he exhorts Timothy to do this, to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, Avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from, from a pure heart. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, uh, following. So are you pursuing godliness? Am I pursuing godliness? Or as Paul put it to Timothy, are we pursuing righteousness, faith, love, and peace? Is our character, who we are from the inside out, godly? Is a godly character evident in our lives? And is it evident in the good times and in the bad times and those places in between? Can we say with the psalmist, with all sincerity, I love your commands more than gold, more than pure gold, and because I consider all your precepts precepts right, I hate every wrong path. Verse 127 and 128. Well, friends, this move from the realm of individuals like you and me into the corporate, into the larger body. We see that the promises and the blessings and the curses, curses that we find in the Old Testament concerning the covenant uh, that God had made with his chosen people on Mount Sinai during uh, the Exodus, were given to the nation as a whole. Yes, individuals were involved, but this was a covenant with the nation of Israel. We go back further to the time of Abraham, and we remember that God had promised years before the Exodus that he would be the father of many nations. And we see this partially fulfilled on Mount Sinai, or at Mount Sinai, where God gives the law to the nation of Israel and makes a covenant All this to say that while personal holiness and righteousness is something the people of God are to pursue, it is lived out in the context of the corporate body. And in in our context today, it is the body of Christ. I mentioned earlier that the godliness of an individual believer is directly related to the extent the church reflects the holiness of God in practice, especially as we look in contrast to the culture of the world we live in. The word of God, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, exhort the people of God, that is you and me today, to be holy as God is holy. 
We can think of the Old Testament again. That God had set Israel apart for what? As a reflection of his character and nature. As a witness to the surrounding nations to the holiness and righteousness of God. And we know from the history of Israel, individuals failed, sometimes kings failed to be holy as God is holy. I'm not talking about perfectionism there. Keep that in mind. And we see that this impacted not only them themselves as individuals, but the nation as a whole. For God had set Israel apart to reflect corporately as the people of God to the nations the truth that God is holy other, that God is set apart from evil, that God is set apart from injustice and lies. The prophet Isaiah, we can go to him, he had a vision of God sitting on a throne. And what, what did he see? There in that text in Isaiah chapter 6, he describes the, these, these angelic beings, the seraphim, calling out to one another, calling out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. We can even go to the book of Deuteronomy. Sometimes referred to as Moses' last will and testament. We see there in Deuteronomy that Israel was about to cross over the Jordan into the promised land. And Moses reminded Israel that they were to go into that promised land, dispose nations greater and mightier than you, cities great and fortified, a people great and tall. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 1. Then he said this to them, Know therefore today that he who goes over before you as a consuming fire is the Lord your God. He will destroy them and subdue them before you as the Lord has promised you. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 3. And then he warned Israel as they were to go. He warned them, do not say in your heart after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you. It is because of my righteousness that the Lord, that the Lord uh, did this. Deuteronomy 9.9. 9. It wasn't because Israel was righteous that they would possess the land. It was because the wicked of those nations that the is. The, uh, the, uh, the Lord your God drove them out. Deuteronomy 9, 5. I've said that kind of weird. You can check it out for yourself. Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 5. Friends, God is the Holy One. God is the Righteous One. And he warned Israel that it is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve. You shall not go after other gods. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. At least the anger of the Lord your God is kindled against you, and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. Deuteronomy 6, verse 13 to 15. Well, we know that Judah was taken into captivity because they did not hear and abide the word of the Lord. So with this in mind, we return again back to the psalmist, who we discovered had done what is, in verse um, 121, what is just and right. And we see that this brought opposition from those around him. We go back there to verse 122, 121 and 122 to see this. And this is where the psalmist's faith was tested. My friends, may I say to you, your faith will be tested today in this world that we live. But back to the psalmist as his faith was tested. As we read through that, that stanza, we see that the godly character, the godliness of this psalmist was up to the challenge. The psalmist had put his trust in the righteous promise of God. Verse 123. Friends, godliness responds in faith to the promises of God. Godliness responds in faith to the promises of God. We see that the psalmist had placed his hope in the promise of salvation while enduring the hardship of his oppressors. Verse 123. Friends, godly, godliness endures hardship. We see the psalmist demonstrated a teachable spirit, Psalm uh, verse 124. Friends, godliness is manifest in a teachable spirit. Do you have a teachable spirit? Is the Holy Spirit permitted to teach you the word of God and change you and mold you and shape you to become more and more like Christ? We see that the psalmist was zealous to honor God and his commandments, verse 127, and he hated the ungodly way of life. Verse 128, friends, godly, godliness is zealous for the honor of God 
and his word and hates the wrong path. Verse 128. Well, friends, this brings us back to uh, the question. Do you pursue godliness? Well, according to Payne, the church today is more interested in anything but godliness. And I, I'm afraid I would have to agree with Payne on this one. And maybe the church has forgotten that the New Testament describes the church as someone, as someone once said, <coughs> quote, as a set-apart people called to reflect before the watching world, the truth that God is set apart from all evil, falsehood, and injustice, end quote. My friends, this begins with you and me. It begins with you and me. Have you taken the first step then toward being a godly man or woman? And this begins, my friends, by surrendering your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, verse 6. You know, we can all learn how to behave, how to follow rules. We can all do that, but we cannot become godly. Hear me on this. We cannot become godly people. We cannot be the holy and righteousness of God without the sanctifying sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. Because godliness is more than what we do. Godliness is a lifelong seeking after God's very own heart. After his ways, not our ways. Godliness is from the inside out. It's an inward devotion and motivation for God that is made manifest outwardly in our words, in our actions, in our thoughts. So a godly person is someone who has placed their trust in the one-time sacrifice of Christ on the cross for their sin once for all. A godly person is one who has received the righteousness of God credited to him by faith alone, not by anything they can do, by no works at all. A godly person has set their heart toward obedience to the word of God. A godly person endeavors to live a holy life, as the Apostle Peter said, to be holy as he is holy. A godly person lives a life that's not about pleasing the selfish, sinful nature, but pleasing God over all. A godly person relies on God's strength, on his strength, not their own, to overcome temptation. A godly person has died to their flesh, to their sinful nature. Apostle Paul put it this way in his letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verse 24. Paul said, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. My friends, the godly person repents when they sin. And sin is taken seriously. A godly person leads by example. A godly person lives in sexual purity. And I've, as I said to the church today, that is so much needed in the world around us today. And as personally as a man and personally as a Christian, godly sexual purity is necessary. A godly person is a servant. A godly person serves others over themselves. The godly person loves God with all their heart and mind and body and spirit. A godly person loves their neighbor as themselves. A godly person seeks to obey God in every area of our lives. A godly person loves God over all other things. So the question is, are you pursuing godliness? Let us pray. Our Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge that is before us today in regards to godliness in the church, individually, corporately, and in the contrast to our, to our culture today. Oh Lord, may you uh, give us the strength, give us wisdom and discernment in all these things. For your glory we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Shalom.